at least names on this list. I want to say a shout out to my uh, Purdue colleagues if I can do that, Scott. But I also see a lot of friends out here that are from other states uh, that I want to say hello to. Can everybody hear me okay? Scott, can you hear me all right? Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, I know this is not an interactive because you can you can hear me, but you can't uh, uh, but you can't really ask questions other through the chat box. But I think Scott already explained to you how to do that. Hey, I know we only have 30 minutes, so I'm going to try to work through this kind of in a very quick pace, and I hope that we have some Q and A at the very end. But I want to go ahead and really introduce you to this new uh, curricula that we've been developing for some time called Ready Community. And I want to first begin by acknowledging a lot of the people who are really instrumental in making this. Uh, product a reality. Uh, my colleagues at the W Western Rural Development Center, Rachel Walburn used to be my colleague at the Southern Rural Development Center, Deborah Tootle, who at the time was at the University of Arkansas, is now at Iowa State, Lori Garkovich at Kentucky, Virginia Morgan at Auburn, and Shelley Murdoch at the University of California. So these people we've been working for a long, long time, and this is really the fruition, kind of the, the fruits of a, a lot of labor over the last uh, uh, several months, if not years. Uh, I'm going to give you kind of the punchline from right at the up front. What is Ready Community? Well, it's six modules total. It has with it a number of different PowerPoints that provide you as an extension educator the full set of materials you, need, you may need uh, to work with the communities. A facilitator's guide that really provides really kind of a roadmap for you as you begin to do this training. Uh, really, you know, the background information, just getting you a sense of what you might want to communicate as a PowerPoint slide comes up. Worksheets, we've got worksheets galore. We make it very interactive, very, you know, very uh, hands-on, not a whole lot of, not lecture, but more providing key concepts and then the people really get to work. And then where appropriate, we have uh, data that are provided that it really helps them get a better understanding of the uh, various features of their community. So I want to kind of give you the punchline right up front as to what this is like. I'm going to give you the website at the very end that you can access and be able to look at at, at your leisure. Uh, this, for example, is, is just a page of one of the PowerPoints. That, this is the facilitator's guide that, again, will outlines what you say, the, again, the, the substance of what you would want to talk about as you show a particular slide. Uh, during the course of your training with your communities that you're going to work with. Uh, so that's just an example. So let me go ahead now and say, what is this whole thing going to be about today? Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about FEMA and the FEMA's involvement in this kind of program. The, uh, then I'm going to talk about some program highlights related to the Ready Community uh, curriculum. Uh, what we think are some challenges in terms of what we've faced as we try to implement this program. Uh, we have now have it in seven states across the country on a pilot basis, but we have just recently done training uh, largely through funding from the University of Kentucky, a special uh, grant that they got from uh, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, NIFA. Uh, got some money for them to really expand the Ready community to more states. So that training took place last week. And then hopefully time for Q&A, more Q&A, maybe I should say chat and A. So you're going to give chat, you're going to ask a question via the chat, and I'm going to hopefully be able to answer it uh, through audio. Uh, this is not an unfamiliar story. All of you are very well aware about the challenges that face the southern region of the country, particularly Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, that were heavily, even Texas, that were heavily hit, impacted by Katrina and Rita a few years ago. What it did for FEMA is made them realize that they really were really are not prepared to deal with some of these particular challenges that face low wealth communities, low wealth neighborhoods, those who really had no capability resource wise to escape the, uh, the, the challenges of these major, major uh, natural disasters. Uh, a lot of, you, know, you, you remember the press was pretty negative, everything was pretty negative in the media. And I think FEMA took this to heart to say, you know, we really got to prepare ourselves better for what may be these kinds of uh, events happening again in various parts of the country. So they turned to the Cooperative Extension Service, largely NIFA. They came to NIFA at the federal level to say, look, we really need help because you have the network in place. Can you help us? And this was not to say anything against Eden was a very, as you know, the Extension Disaster Education Network is a phenomenal resource. But what was probably not quite as in-depth in terms of those resources is the area of community. How can we help community build the capacity to uh, respond to, uh, you know, plan for, and, and rebound from uh, from disasters. So that's why they came to extension, and uh, and that request then came to uh, the Southern World Development Center and others, that included my regional center partners, to really begin to say how how might we be able to 
to build this capacity. Let me just say very briefly that one of the first phases of our project with FEMA was to actually do uh, assessments, roundtable meetings in five states. We actually held 30 roundtables across these five states. And this one king thing that came out time and time again, rural areas, those who were less populated, had really challenges with regard to respond to, to disasters. They really did not have that capability in place, had not planned for it, did not have a really organized response. And, uh, and rural areas, uh, rural air, urban areas were much, much better at it because they had more use, uh, resources, more people in place who could help do that kind of planning. But it became very, very challenging for rural areas. So, so we came back to FEMA and they gave us funding to really begin working with them on a response. Primarily, let me just say, this curriculum is, at least when we designed it and developed it, was designed primarily for those rural areas, those small communities that really did not have that capacity in place through, through formal government institutions to really do this kind of planning. But it's, it's not to say that it would not be available to neighborhoods and urban areas that really would, would really benefit from this kind of planning. This is the document that FEMA came out with in terms of how to respond to the disasters of Rita and Katrina. They had maintaining and uh, developing and maintaining emergency operation plans. It's called a Comprehensive Preparedness Guide, what we fondly call the CPG 101. And I've given you a link here in case you really want to look at it. What that CBG document had was six steps to doing uh, to doing this kind of ready community, this kind of planning. And for those of you who are on, the, who are on this uh, webinar, and who have a background in community development, I think you're going to say, well, my gosh, this is community development at, at, at best. It's really the, the skill sets many of you bring to the table. This is really taking those skill sets and orienting it or engaging it in the, in the, in the, in the disaster preparedness kind of uh, uh, you know, venue. So, so I, I don't think what I'm going to share with you is, if, is anything earth shattering. What it is really useful to is we built the set of resources that are really oriented more to, uh, to disaster uh, preparedness. So anyway, um, what I want to do now is very quickly walk you through some of the different steps of what we developed. And, uh, and by the way, I want to make sure that I let you know there's a resource right to you on the right of your panel. And I don't know whether uh, Rosa can show you. There's a quick overview uh, of this. Uh, of this product to your right called the Ready Community Overview. Uh, feel free to download that. That kind of gives you the, the, the nice brief uh, synopsis of what this program is all about. And, uh, and uh, it really, uh, what I'm saying today really uh, is, is really uh, captured pretty well in that uh, particular overview document. Uh, so I don't, it didn't show up here, but anyway, it's, it's there for you to download. Uh, the first one we talked about was how to form a collaborative planning team. Um, here it is. I think you can see a little bit of there, but all right, you see it, uh, and it just lays out what this, what the elements of this program are all about, and uh, how, how to pr produce a, how to prepare a uh, planning team and whatnot. So, Rose, that's fine. I'll go ahead and move it here. If you, oh, maybe you can move it. Okay, good. Uh, the first thing was how do you form a collaborative planning team, and this really, this particular module really gives you the nuts and bolts of how you organize a team to be engaged in doing this particular work. This is not extension doing it. This is extension educators serving as kind of the facilitators, the coach, uh, the person who's really guiding this work, but really the hard work uh, rests with the team that you put together. So what we do is we lay out the framework for how you build these three different entities. The core team made up of key uh, players who are engaged and who have a, either a extension as well as people who have a major role either on a volunteer or formal basis in terms of disaster preparedness, like your emergency management teams uh, but, and others that you think need to be at the table. Then you have a planning team, which is a larger group of people who work not as frequently. The core team is really the one that's in, they're the ones who watch, who kind of guide us throughout the whole process. The planning team is that larger body who really help uh, provide guidance to the core team. And then the community, because we provide different points in this uh, six modules, where you have to reach out to the community, engage them in conversation, and have them react to some of the ideas and plans that, that, uh, that uh, the planning team and the core team are working on in tandem. 
And then you have that community coach. Well, that's the extension educator. That's the role you play for those who have an extension appointment. Uh, or, or somebody else could do that if you have another other entity that would be uh, more appropriately uh, 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 available to do that kind of work. I've given you as well another, uh, there's another uh, attachment or handout, handout number two. That one just tells you the specific job responsibilities of, of both the core team and the planning team. Uh, and, and what the role is of the coach or facilitator. So that lays it out for them. As you recruit these individuals, you make it pretty clear to them, here's my expectations. This is the kind of role you have to play. And you know, do you want to, are you willing to really be part of this team? So this lays out the, the specific roles and responsibilities. Very, very important. Okay, so let me move on then. Thank you, Rosa. So the next thing we do is, is, is to try to identify, well, okay, who should be on that planning team? These are the different, uh, I hope you can see this, these are the different categories that FEMA has I talked about. Fire services, emergency management, management education, utilities. Uh, again, you see all these different groups. Uh, what's not there is something that you in your own, if you were to do this in your community, you ask the community a core team or the planning team, say, okay, help me figure out who we're missing here. Who should be part of our planning team? Uh, and some of it may very well be, for example, there's nothing there for business and industry. They may be low, you know, if you have specific needs in terms of low wealth neighborhoods or communities, you need to have representation there. So the key is to really make sure that that planning team really captures a full breadth and diversity of the community that, that you're actually working in. The third step, second step is really to understand the situation. What we do is after we have the planning teams, we say we really want you to take a hard look at what it is you are vulnerable. What are the vulnerabilities that you have in your community? Uh, and we ask them to, to think historically about what kind of major events have impacted the community. Hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, uh, went, you know, severe winter weather. And they really kind of lay out that framework and begin to recognize what are some of the diversity of hazards of disasters that they faced over the years, and that sensitizes them, sensitize them to the kind of uh, uh, you know, hazard or issue that they might want to consider. We also, at the same time, ask them to think about vulnerability in the long these three dimensions. Are there vulnerable people? People who are disabled, people who have specific you know, medical needs, people who are low wealth, who have limited transportation options. Uh, people, single parent families, those who are in nursing homes. I mean, you can think of the full breadth of people who have really special needs when it comes to disasters uh, and how the, the, the particular vulnerability they may have. We ask them to look at buildings. What are the vulnerable buildings or the key buildings that would be a major problem for you if you were not to be able to have that functioning? It could be a local government, it could be a hospital, a school system. So we, again, they make an assessment of that. And are those buildings located in places that might be prone to specific uh, uh, you know, natural calamities like flooding or whatnot? And then the communication links. What, what may be the, how do you communicate? Uh, in Katrina and Rita, in some places, the whole communication system was completely gone. So what do you do in that case? What are some of the background uh, alternatives you may have uh, for maintaining communication? I can tell you, I was in one rural community when we did the assessment uh, in the early phase of FEMA, uh, uh, and we met with a lot of different people from law enforcement. They had fires, you know, uh, obviously uh, law enforcement, all the emergency management. They had no capability, uniform capability of communicating with one another. This was a real rude awakening for them about how they need to really pay attention to these particular kinds uh, of challenges. So the third then goal then is to look at, after they've done kind of assessment and gotten a little sensitive to what may be some of the major hazards, we ask them to begin thinking about goals. And then we put objectives here. I probably should have changed that to actions. We try to get a little bit away from the academic jargon. But we said, uh, we asked them to learn, we, we introduced in the scenario planning. We tell them to look at what's, what are some of the major threats. And then what are the ways in which you can tackle each of those threats? And we ask them to build goals based upon the SMART principles, which I'll show, I'll show you in a minute. We ask them to test the scenario planning process by, again, by selecting one or more hazards. And then based on the scenario planning, uh, develop a specific goals. So here, for example, is the scenario planning that we give them the kind of the overview of. Uh, identifying the threats, assessing vulnerability, that would be the ones that would happen in the first couple of steps. Building scenarios and generating options 
uh, is really the what we're doing in this particular phase, and then the subsequent phase of testing options and beginning the uh, action plans comes a little bit later in the modules. But it just lays out kind of the big picture of the kind of stages that we're asking this team to go through. Uh, we ask them to think about goals in the context of the way FEMA thinks. FEMA thinks along the, the basis of emerg emergency, uh, emergency support functions, what they call ESF. I have given you as another handout the 15, I don't know if it has changed, but uh, in our curriculum we have 15 ESFs such as communication, transportation, ESF4 for example is firefighting, uh, mass care, emergency assistance, housing and human services, ESF6. So we ask them to think about given that you've identified particular hazards to what specific kind of ESF, you know, what uh, emergency support function that, that does that most closely align. And so we get them to think in the mindset of FEMA because FEMA wants you to build a plan that is consistent with their kind of their terminology and their language. So they look at these ESFs and then we help them kind of figure out okay now build SMART goals based upon those specific ESFs that you've identified. Let's say for example it's mass care. Uh, then what, what are the, how, what is it that you want to determine in terms of your, your goals related to handling, uh, you know, uh, providing a, a place for people to be housed in the, in the event of a major disaster. So we take them through these SMART goals which again gives, it builds goals that are much more measurable, it has a lot more, it's time framed. It really gives more of the specificity that they need to make sure that they're tackling those goals in a timely fashion and they know that these are the right, the right mix of goals to, to, to pursue. Uh, then for example, here's, here's an, uh, one of, uh, uh, that I put up here as an example. ESF 15 is emergency public information. A SMART goal would be something like this, 100% of all the people in the, in the county's flood prone, prone area will be notified within four hours of an evacuation order being issued by a state, county, or local emergency management personnel. That's, it tells you you have a specific set, you know what the metric is, you know you want to reach everybody, uh, and you've got a particular targeted area. Then we have a couple of examples of how you would achieve that goal, and we have a couple of specific actions that might be relevant. Uh, you know, develop a communication plan in the neighborhood or whatever. So that's the kind of way in which you build this plan in a much more, give it the specificity it needs. Then we go into developing the plan and we're building on what we just did in step three. Uh, you know, we talk about what are the possible options of dealing with that particular goal. Do we have the capacity? And that's where we do an inventory asset. And I've given you as a handout for just an example of the inventory assets, the individual assets that you can inventory, but it all deals specifically with uh, disaster related issues. Somebody, you know, uh, do you have, uh, again, do you have specific equipment that we might be able to mobilize? Like if you're in the farming communities, a lot of equipment we could actually mo mobilize in the time of a disaster. So this is really framed in terms of individual assets as it relates to disaster preparedness or disaster response and dis dis disaster rebounding. Uh, we also have one for groups. What are the organizational assets that might exist that again align with uh, the, this kind of need that we would have to support our plan? Uh, and once you've done that assessment, then you may be able to dig, figure out that there are certain options that are much more viable because uh, you have the resources in place to really help make that happen. And then you implement. And to make it simple, you know, I mean, those of us in academia, you know, in working in extension, you know we can build these plans pretty, a lot of detail, very, very in-depth, very complicated, but for communities, they can't, you can't give them that kind of framework. So we build a very, very simple, uh, it's almost like a logic model, really. Uh, what's the ESF goal in this case, for example, I'm saying it could be uh, emergency prepared, I mean, the, uh, it could be uh, mass care, emergency management. Uh, what's your specific, you take one action at a time and then you build these, what's the steps, who's responsible, what are the other partners that we have within the community that can be engaged, what are the other assets we may have, and that could be organizational assets uh, and timeline. So you know, again, you have this really well delineated as to what the expectations are. And then we go into prepare, uh, review and approve a plan. They actually get into uh, building a plan and they actually can do one of two scenarios. They can either say we want to do a tabletop scenario where we say, okay, let's assume that we have been impacted, that we have a, you know, a, uh, 
a, a major hurricane uh, coming, uh, uh, well, let's, maybe let's say flooding is probably one that you can anticipate a little bit better. Let's assume that we've been given a 24-hour notice that we have a major flood coming. Uh, that's the scenario, and they have to then say, how would you work through all the different things that would have to be done? Uh, or you can actually do almost like we do and like, like we have a lot of times on campuses or universities or even in communities where they actually have a, a real live, let's make believe that this, we're going to go through everything. We're going to make believe there's been a major calamity and the community it actually goes through all the, all the uh, different entities who are responsible for having uh, an engaged in disaster uh, response are actually go through uh, this as, a, as, a, as an example. It's just a testing it and see where were the flaws, what do we need to improve and whatnot. Uh, we, this plan is then distributed to the public. Uh, a colleague of ours at Montana, I'm not sure if Barbara Andreozzi is on, uh, Barbara actually brought her community together with her, the planning team and core team met with the community. They invited the community to come in, look at our plan, help fine tune it, tell us where we went wrong. And they were hoping to get about 50 to 75 people to show up. They had 300 people who came in their community to look at this plan and to weigh in on it. It was an extremely powerful message about the value of this particular pro process for that community. Then you go implement and maintain the plan. In other words, that group could be con should constantly be meeting uh, and to make sure that plan remains uh, really vibrant, on, on the mark. You know, there may have been some changes. We may have a, a place where we had mass shelter that no longer is available, uh, or new ones have come online. So this thing is constantly being uh, updated, and, uh, and, and, and you maintain a schedule of how to keep that particular product really, really uh, uh, relevant. Um, the challenges for us, as we've seen it, uh, is this. Um, does the cooperative extension have a role to play? Uh, if so, what is our role? Uh, you know, we say you're, we're a coach, we're a catalyst, we're a facilitator. We provide the resources of the universities to help in terms of looking at information, vulnerability. Uh, we use some social vulnerability index that uh, Susan Cutter has developed from South Carolina. We, do, we just bring a lot of that information to help them make better decision, decisions about their emergency plan. Uh, but there, are, there has been... Uh, some pushback by people who feel that uh, they have the formal responsibility of doing emergency management. And we've had that difficulty in some states only to eventually win them over because they realized that what Extension was doing was not a duplication but a real value added to the kind of work that they're doing. Keep in mind that we're really talking about this being pr principally relevant to communities. A lot of them don't have disaster plans. Counties typically do and of course the state does but sometimes these smaller communities don't, so we urge them to build a plan that is consistent and does not go at odds with the county plan, but that really provides a unique, tailored response in their particular community. Uh, so you see all this, uh, the things I, uh, ep the episodic nature of disasters, it's hard to keep a team vibrant and act active when uh, disasters don't, aren't there every week. Uh, again, engaging the emergency management, gaining their acceptance, that takes time but it's really working in most of the states we've been looking at. The length of the planning process and maintaining uh, this engagement. It's not, uh, you know, this is not a one-shot deal where you do this for three months and go home and, and all is lost. No, it's going to be really, it's an ongoing investment by the part of extension educators. Uh, the technical support for planning teams, again, the work of extension educators and others, that's always a challenge to make sure we have all the right players at the table. And of course, evaluating the so what. Uh, how can we make sure that what we've been doing it really makes a real difference in the lives of these uh, communities and these people? So anyway, uh, this is our website. I think Scott may have already put it up there. Uh, the Ready Community, the, he's got the link that goes directly to the curricula. Uh, Rachel has been my colleague in crime at the West, at the Southern World Development Center. Uh, of course, is, uh, the, the website is not public yet. I mean. Uh, what Scott gave you is really access directly to our materials. You're free to use those as you see fit. I just know that we're now in another, we're still fine tuning the materials, even though what we have there is really in fairly good shape. But we're always, just like we're asking these communities to keep their plan vibrant, alive, and updated all the time, we're trying to do the same thing with our ready community materials. So I think at, at that, I'm going to stop. It gives me about three to five minutes to. Uh, to respond to questions. Again, quick and dirty overview, but hopefully you can go to the website and really find some valuable information there for those of you who may be interested in this particular program. 
By the way, the bottom line is this. This, this is disaster. It's a disaster response, but this is really, really community development work. It's, the bottom line is that is really what drives this process. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Bo. Thanks, Bo, for, uh, for that great overview of, of the program. Uh, well, folks are, are typing in their questions into the chat box. I had one. Um, suppose, um, you know, somebody wants to implement this and they're feeling like they, they need a little bit of extra help in going through it the first time. Is there, are there resources available that way where somebody could, uh, somebody who's more uh, conversant with the program could uh, work with them to get that done? And if so, how, does, how would they access that? And, or is it all very self-explanatory and, and you feel they don't really need uh, that kind of assistance? Uh, really, I think what we could do, we, we, what we would make available to you, we do have a team that's continuing to work on, on this material. We have a national team that's been, that they, most of them have already been identified, but Allison Davis at the University of Kentucky is now working with us as well. All of us, if, if you were interested and say, look, Bo, we really would like to do this in our state, can we go through a little bit more thorough training, could be online, we'd be glad to do that. If you're interested in more face-to-face, -face, uh, we'll just have to figure out a way to just, I mean, well, obviously nobody's looking for any money for, for the cost of this. This is available for you at no cost. But if, if there's a way to get some travel support to get some of the trainers there, we could do a session at your own respective state, too, if you felt there was, a, there was sufficient interest. Or it could be done, Scott, on a regional level, you know, if you want to do a multi-state, multi okay? And for those of you in... in yeah, so that, in Indiana, we could do this right back in our backyard. At no, you know, we could get that done, no problem. Well, actually, you know, for for folks that are from the North Central region, we're just, uh, you know, tomorrow we've got a board meeting, and I expect to get approval for releasing our call for small grant proposals. And you know, you could build in the travel, uh, some travel money to to bring this to your, you know, a, tra a group of trainers to your state uh, around this topic. Um, so that might be another uh, another option for getting Absolutely. it done. Absolutely. So, um, if there's a if there's enough interest on the part of those who are on the on this webinar, uh, Scott, that would provide us with the uh, you know the justification to come to you with that request. So, um, so you you've kind of got each other's names there on the so you could be maybe making a making some matches there, but um, feel free to type in a question into the into the chat box um, and so where if somebody wanted to start this program what would be the kind of the first thing the first type of person they would talk to in a local area you know how would they identify the need for this in a local area uh, I would uh, you know of course the the, the low-hanging fruit would be the people who are in emergency management um, uh, and of course, be ready for it. Some of them will be very supportive. Others will be a little bit, uh, they'll be a little bit wary of, uh, of that request. But again, that's just a matter of, uh, you know, trust building. So emergency man management people, people are, you know, that, that I've given you a list of these different planning team members. Uh, I think the, the, to me, the first step would be to get people who might be interested in serving as a core team. And then, you know, in, in the good extension style, see if you can brainstorm with your core team who are the key people we really need to touch base with? And you'd like to have on a core team, those people are really highly respected. Could be somebody from emergency management who now becomes more of your advocate as opposed to the person who's a little bit of, at odds with what you're doing. Uh, we have a lot of examples across the country of people have been doing this program successfully. We could always have a conference call with these people to say, why did this make a difference? Why is this something we should do? So I would think I would probably start the core team and let that core team build a plan on how to reach out to a larger set of key players. But those are specified, I would say, Scott, in that little, uh, some of that diagram I showed earlier. Definitely law enforcement. People, uh, you know, I think business and industry would be really interested in this. Uh, local government officials, uh, school system, you know, just all those who would really have a, a, a keen interest in trying to be prepared for disasters that may strike our community. So you wouldn't like uh, go to any any state agencies and say, uh, you know, gee, we've got this FEMA, you know, this thing that was put together with assistance from FEMA, and uh, you know, we were able to deliver this in state X Y Z, you know, your state and and or, or our state, I guess, and and uh, what would be some communities that you would see as a 
as a state agency would be most like if you went to the state police or or National Guard and and you know what what communities would be maybe most amenable to being the the, the first ones out of the box. You wouldn't do anything well, like that if you're trying to do this at the state. No, level. Scott, that's an excellent example. That's I, I was I guess I wasn't that work operating at that higher level. I was just operating more at the local level. But absolutely, uh, but you know, but again, it, uh, hopefully you'll have people who are in your organization. You know, in your if you're with extension, you may have people who built some very strong ties with the with the state uh, emergency management team. Uh, uh, it, it would well be worthwhile to talk to them and some other key players that might really support this kind of work at the state level. Uh, but again, not all of them will be, uh, there is a certain culture within FEMA, those of you who may have worked with them, there is a kind of this uh, command and control uh, uh, concept, and, 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 but FEMA is trying to change that culture to really make it much more in an empowerment process, which is what I think this program is trying to do and why it has, in fact, been embraced by some people in FEMA uh, at the state level and local level, but not by everybody. You know. Okay, are any of the pilot efforts working with tribal areas or reservations-based disaster recovery groups? Uh, Mary, not from what I remember. I don't remember a group that's been working specifically uh, on reservations, uh, tribal areas, uh, which make this particularly, you know, your interest would be extremely viable to us to see how that operates. Uh, on, in tribal areas? Very, very good question. But I'm not aware of any, though again, they just trained people last week. I was not able to go, so I could always ask. I can pass this uh, question down to Rachel Welber to see if she knows of anything that I may not have been aware of. But Mary, if you're willing to send me an email, uh, I'll be glad to communicate with you once I ask with, uh, check with Rachel, okay? All right. Any other questions from the group? We're trying to make these uh, fairly quick so you get a quick overview. Um, and we are pretty well out of time, so unless uh, anybody has a, a pressing question, uh, we can wind yeah, things send up. Send me an email. I'd be glad to respond to it. Thank you, all of you, for joining us today, and I hope this was useful. Take care, Scott. Thank you for doing this. Thanks.